Good morning. So today we're going to add something a little bit new. Um, we're going to be talking about the pork rind fast. Uh, I was watching Dr. Boz the other day, and Dr. Boz is is doing. Uh, he's, she's doing some of the Lord's work. She's helping people lose significant amounts of weight, retrain their metabolism. And some other really good stuff. I don't agree with everything she says or does, but I agree with a lot of it. Um, <clears throat> and she mentioned the um, sardine fast uh, recently in that uh, group that she took off with a couple of hundred people to do. And it's like, you know, that's interesting. I've been doing sardine fasts for a while. Now, what is a sardine fast? If you don't like sardines, and most of us don't, it's a challenge. And she brings up the really good point that um, you don't have to work, worry about people overeating on that fast. Um, Penn Gillette lost, what was it, over 100 pounds on a potato fast. Now, you would think potatoes, a potato fast, that may be the worst thing you could do. I've got a video on it. Look it up. Um, anything that helps somebody that needs to lose a hundred pounds that helps them lose a hundred pounds. I'm a big fan of. And part of the issue is, you know, you tell your body, okay, this is the only thing I, I can eat for a day or two or three. Then your body tends to start saying, okay, you know, I wore, I'm worn out on this potato or clearly sardines. It's very easy to get worn out on sardines. And uh, guess what? It's you can get worn out on pork rinds too. In fact, most people, uh, a lot of people, don't like pork rinds in the beginning. Um, but I'll show you a few things that might make you reconsider. Um, <clears throat> now, here's one of the questions: Are these really fasts? I'm not going to get into that today. I'm going to get into some other stuff, though. And that's actually not our, uh, our major topic. Our major topic is looking at a new antioxidant supplement. Uh, it's coming out of the blocks, and a lot of it looks really good. But wait until you look under the hood before you make a decision to purchase a new supplement. It's one of those things that helps make the point that, hmm, is the supplement industry really regulated effectively? Just because something's sold as a supplement, uh, are you sure that it's safe? And I think the answer is a clear no, you're not. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and just do the intro to the show. For those of you who have not seen our uh, content before, we're all about helping people uh, recognize, manage, prevent the major killers and disablers in our world, heart attack, stroke, kidney disease, eye disease, uh, and some other issues like uh, erectile dysfunction. And guess what? All of those have a, an underlying common root cause. Oh, by the way, and I had a senior moment and I almost forgot to mention Alzheimer's, dementia. Now, what is the, the common root denominator or the common... Uh, root cause, prediabetes, diabetes. And unfortunately, most of us think, well, a diabetes is really clear. If you've got it, you're not going to miss that. Unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. 90% of prediabetes and diabetes is missed. And when you say prediabetes and diabetes, uh, there's the assumption that diabetes is the problem. Prediabetes is just a pre-problem, not an issue, and it's safe. No, they're, they're both diseases. They are both not safe, and they both lead to heart attack. And both are the most common causes of heart attack, stroke, dementia. You name those things that I listed before. So unfortunately, the major things that are killing us... I, even our doctors don't know how to diagnose, let alone manage. I mean, there's science out there all over the place that shows that two thirds of doctors here in, in the U.S. don't know how to diagnose prediabetes, let alone manage it. So that's what this channel is all about. 
Unfortunately, it's a buyer beware situation when you go to see your doctor. That's the last place it should be. You should be able to trust your doc to know what's what your risk factors are, what's most likely to kill you, and to know how to diagnose that and how to help you deal with it. But unfortunately, you can't rely on your doc. So you have to learn some things. That's what this channel is all about. So previous topics, recent topics, changing the game on obesity, looking at what is obesity actually, what really causes it, and giving a lot more details about, is it just calories or is it hormones? Or is it both? And we've gotten a lot of good feedback on that, uh, that video last week. Quote, the verdict on vitamin D. The verdict turns out to be anything but. You know, even though it was a big study in one of the top journals in the, in the world, in medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, that vital study really didn't give us that much of a verdict on vitamin D. And we go into detail on why. Uh, it's been a big, uh, a big fad for folks like Peter Atia, uh, uh, some other folks to cover things on like on ApoB and say ApoB is the real driver here. ApoB is important. There's no question about it. But is it the major focus? Hmm. I don't think so. And again, we go into details on why we believe that and what, what ApoB is and what it's not. So that's some of the stuff that we've covered recently. <clears throat> if you would like to protect your, your life, protect yourself from heart attack, stroke, dementia, the things that we mentioned, uh, here's a quick, relatively quick, inexpensive, relatively easy. It takes a couple hours to get through e any of these four courses. The, uh, the conference course is a longer thing. It's more comprehensive. It's about nine hours, but the other three are about two hours, hour and a half to two hours a piece. And with those, you can learn the key drivers of heart attack and stroke plaque. Hey doc, <clears throat> uh, how about if we, we just get a, a stress test and make sure I don't have a heart attack coming. That's not the way it works. That's what Tim Russert did right before he died and he passed it and then he died of a heart attack and he's not the only one that happens a lot. So there's a course, we've got a course here on how to evaluate plaque and it's not with a stress test. <clears throat> insulin resistance. What is insulin resistance? We'll keep using that term already in this show. And what is it? It gives you the details on it. And then cardiovascular inflammation. Some of the final common pathway starting from insulin resistance. If you're interested in our content and you're <clears throat> not so much a YouTuber, uh, we, have, we have content on Locals, on Rumble. And in fact, some of our content you can only get on Locals. Um, <clears throat> those of you who want to help us get that content out, uh, take a look at joining the YouTube uh, membership. I'm going to skip over the... Uh, the discussion about subscriptions today and that talk for a minute about Medicare. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> Medicare is a U.S. federal government project. I've never met a federal U.S. government project that I didn't think was full of bureaucrats. <laughs> we, we are running into challenges right now in terms of getting the bureaucrats to get over the fact that we do telemedicine and <clears throat> that's okay. I know that I expected it. I actually work for a couple of national tele telemedicine companies at this point, uh, MD live and K health, both of whom have Medicare based programs, neither of whom have clinics in this, in the state, but <clears throat> You know, when you work with bureaucrats, you also tend to become bureaucratic. So we've got some people that are supposed to be setting up our uh, our participation with the sites uh, with Medicare in the different states. And now they're saying, no, wait a minute. We have to have a clinic site. We know we ex they accept uh, telemedicine, but you got to have a clinic site. <clears throat> so uh, yeah. <laughs> as you can tell. 
uh, uh, we're at a frustrating point right now in terms of this challenge. We will overcome it. We are, uh, are already setting up methods for, for workarounds uh, to meet the challenges that the bureaucrats throw in front of us because we enjoy getting, uh, getting you access to good health care. We're continuing to get our a AWVs started, uh, annual wellness visits, the CCM program. Uh, <clears throat> just to give you some update on that, one of the things we're looking at and talking about is you know, our patients tend to be very, very well informed. In fact, the typical patient that comes to see us knows more about heart attack and stroke prevention than the vast majority of doctors. So we started out, out with uh, some uh, fairly junior people in terms of, uh, of doing some of the CCM discussion and uh, service uh, components. And now we're rethinking that and saying, you know, maybe we need to add more senior people into that mix. So again, to be decided, um, <clears throat> there's no question, you know, it, uh, we will run into challenges and we'll continue to run into challenges. We'll continue to make adjustments. There's also no question that um, we're very committed to this process because we are getting a lot of great feedback from folks saying, I'm so happy that you're going here. I was unable to, to get your services in the past and I will be able to now in the future. So that's our update on the Medicare project. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about pork rind fast. And <clears throat> should, should the term fast be in quotation marks? Maybe it should. You know, that's sort of like that Penn Gillette's potato fast or uh, Dr. Boz's sardine fast. But <clears throat> I've, lost, I've lost significant weight on a sardine fast uh, in the past. I just never knew to or never thought to call it a sardine fast, never thought to, uh, to talk about it. I've also done it more recently with pork rinds. Now, what are pork rinds? Um, <clears throat> I think there's a quote, a quote from, uh, from uh, it's mostly attributed to Mark Twain. And it goes like this, people that like uh, bacon or politics should not watch it being made. And so I'm not going to go into how they make pork rinds. But I will tell you, once I discovered, and I always hated pork rinds. I'm from South Carolina. I'm from the, sort of from the country, the suburbs, Spartanburg. It's a small town. So I should be somebody that liked pork rinds. And in fact, I remember the old men uh, that I would run into, a lot of them would really like pork rinds, especially up in the country in North Carolina, where my mother was from. But to me, they were just, they were crunchy, they were tasteless, they made you thirsty. Well, you know what? <clears throat> I'll agree. They are still an acquired taste. I'll also say this. They're not nearly as hard to eat as um, sardines. Talk about acquired taste. We've also talked about, you know, coming into, uh, into the category of acquired tastes, things that are good, excuse me, good for you, but really don't taste that good, and you know, until you get used to them. Um, uh, Nano, uh, what, what's the, this, uh, again, another senior moment, the, uh, the fermented uh, stuff that you make out of... Um, fermented beans. The Japanese eat it. Um, again, several different acquired tastes, several things that you're not going to want to eat a whole lot of now. But having said that, I've uh, spent some time on these pork rinds and have begun to understand there are some ways to make it taste pretty good. In fact, you can make it taste sort of like a uh, French onion soup without the, uh, the bread because the pork rinds act just like the bread, the toast in French onion soup. And if you want, yep, you can add a little bacon bits. You can add Parmesan. Uh, now, here's the thing about pork rinds. As you see here, and you may not be able to see, let me get in here closer. 
total carbohydrates less than one gram. So they're just, they're a high protein, moderate fat, uh, zero, zero to no or, or low to no carbohydrate fast. So it's a great way to do several things um, that you used to use bread for, like French, uh, like I said, onion, French onion soup. Use it with some uh, simple chicken broth, which obviously, again, also has zero grams of carbs. Um, zero grams of carb, zero to one gram of carb in the um, in the pork rinds. And then, as I said, you can use cheese. Cheese usually has zero carbs as well. As I've mentioned, I have used other things as well. Salmon. I've done salmon fasts. I've done sardine fasts. And uh, I don't usually buy this cheese. I usually buy the Parmesan cheese at Murray's. We've got a nice Murray's at, uh, at our local Kroger's. But my wife buys that. And sometimes I'll just get some Kroger shredded cheese. That's what it looks like. Uh, that was uh, my version of French onion soup. Zero carbs. Um, then again, I had added some other things to that. This is, uh, some bacon grease that, uh, I, uh, have and keep, and I added a little of that as well. So you could say again, is that fasting? Well, it depends on what you put in there. If you just have uh, a few pork rinds and a little bit of, um, of broth, you're going to get very, very few calories. And sure enough, I lost about five pounds a couple of weeks ago uh, on doing exactly just that, eating either dried uh, pork rinds, two meals a day, and this uh, pork rinds with, um, pork rinds only with um, broth only uh, for about three, four days a week. A um, couple of days, on, those were the only meals I had. And then a couple of days, it was two meals out of the day. So significant calorie deficit uh, building up there and resulting in some weight loss, which I wanted to do. I got a little bit heavy when I went through the challenges of uh, running and, and uh, developing the uh, Alabama project. So there you go in terms of um, the pork rind um, fasting. Now let's go to the, um, if you'll give us the water bottle, we'll go to talk about Antioxidants, a new supplement. Is it safe? You know, <clears throat> why is it that Everybody wants to just find the next new supplement that's going to solve all of our problems. Well, I think it's pretty obvious why, because lifestyle is clearly the most important. The most important component of lifestyle is what we eat. And in the U.S. today and in most of the world today, the big, by far the biggest problem is how much we eat and what type of macronutrients? We're just eating way too much. We're eating too many carbs. We need to eat less. When you're eating a lot of carbs, it's very easy to get addicted. And addiction gets into a whole bunch of the hardest thing in the world, and that is our heads. Uh, being human, we're very hard-headed creatures, and we do not want to change our lifestyle. And most specifically, one of the hardest things to do is change the way we eat. Now, wouldn't it be easier and greater and better if we could just figure out, oh, you know what? Something that's really causing all of my health problems, it's inside the mitochondria. The mitochondria are important. I've talked about them multiple times. Um, so that there's just a breakdown in the mitochondria. So if I could get this new supplement, I could fix my health. Here we go again. MitoQ. Is it a promising antioxidant? So in Redox Biology uh, 2020, UK, uh, coming from the UK, they covered 
mito q uh, mitochondrial oxidative damage and excess of oxygen reactive species ros reactive oxygen species have been linked to plaque formation and other chronic diseases like the underlying cause of plaque formation which is prediabetes and diabetes or insulin resistance now mito q consists of a lipophilic cation it's a, a, a ion with a positive component. Just remember the T uh, in uh, cation looks like it's a cross, like a positive, and N in anion uh, stands for negative. So cations are positive, anions are negative. So let's go back uh, now that I took us down that bunny hole. MitoQ consists of a lipophilic, uh, lipid meaning fat, lipophilic meaning loving. So it's a fat loving cation joined to an antioxidant component. It's an antioxidant component that we all know. It's very uh, much available in the grocery store and the drugstore. It's ubiquinone or CoQ10. The expensive version of CoQ10 is ubiquinone. Now, I've been through that uh, discussion and talked about the um, the common perception that ubiquinone is far better than CoQ10 because it's absorbed better. The reality is, yeah, it's absorbed better, but not three and four and six times better. All, it, it's cheaper and just as effective if you think you're not getting enough CoQ10 to just take twice as much CoQ10. Take 400 instead of 200. Don't go out and buy ubiquinone. And I think by the time this presentation is over, you're probably not going to go out and buy MitoQ either, because I certainly haven't. Now, again, let me get back to the, to the script. And let me repeat, because I keep taking this. I can't get through a sentence without taking us down a bunny hole. MitoQ consists of a lipophilic cation joined to an antioxidant ubiquinone, which is thought to insert into the inner mitochondrial membrane thus protecting the mitochondria from oxidative damage. Well, here's another uh, article on this. Free Radical Biology and Medicine, 2011, from the UK. In this study, researchers tested MitoQ in mice to assess the impact of reducing mitochondrial reactive oxidation species in plaque and metabolic syndrome. Now, after administering MitoQ orally for 14 weeks, there was a significant improvement in adiposity, you know, how much fat, um, hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia, and hepatic or liver fat storage. So actually those things are all good. That sounds like, you know, why wouldn't you want to do this? However, there was no impact on plaque formation measured directly in the aortic root. Now, I personally, you know, they mentioned that. I, I, that personally... I'm not getting my OQ, but it's not because of that. I think that's way, too, that's a bridge too far to expect that a supplement is going to impact plaque formation in an aortic root after 14 weeks. It's just totally unrealistic. So what's the problem? We'll talk about it in a minute. Here's another more recent study on MitoQ and vascular function, hypertension 2018 uh, in the UK. Chronic supplementation with a mitochondrial antioxidant, it improves vascular function in healthy older adults. In this double-blinded randomized clinical trial, RCT, 20 healthy people, 60 to 79 years old with impaired endothelial function, brachial artery, artery flow mediated dilation, and again, uh, there are a lot of people that use that. These researchers obviously used it. Am I a big fan? Uh, I don't use it that much. I have used it in the past. I'm not the biggest fan because I think we tend to be majoring on the minors when we look at that. But that's not my concern about this supplement. We'll get to that in a minute. They, uh, the, in the, this randomized clinical trial, uh, 20 subjects, which is not a whole lot, enough to maybe start raising questions and maybe fund a bigger study if it shows something good, which this did. They underwent six weeks of oral supplementation of MitoQ. Brachial artery flow mediated dilation was 40%, 42% higher after MitoQ versus placebo. Aortic stiffness, carotid femoral pulse wave velocity was lower after MitoQ. So again, 
these are fairly obse- objective things. That's a very small study, but um, again, uh, that sounds good. Plasma oxidized LDL was also lower after mito Q. Also sounds very good. So I kept saying, well, I haven't bought into this yet. And here's why. Physiolo- physiological reports, 2018 in Switzerland. The kidney proximal tubules contain very high density of my- mitochondria. So once you get inside the kidney, the kidney is sort of like... <clears throat> A major, it is a high pressure system within our body. It's a high pressure water treatment system. It has some components of water treatment and some components. Well, you know, when you think of water treatment facilities, you think of sewage facilities and you think of uh, drinking water uh, facilities, maybe on opposite ends of the spectrum, but they're not as far apart as you might think. Both of them have a lot of (coughs) filtration they have to do. Both of them have a lot of measurement to make sure that uh, coliforms, uh, gut bacteria, for example, are not in the drinking water, or at least at a low enough level to where uh, it's safe. And again, both of them have a lot of uh, high-tech, high osmolality, high-pressure areas uh, that are required for them to function well. The kidneys are right there, same thing. Mitochondrial dysfunction is implicated in numerous numerous kidney diseases. In this study, which was performed in mice, the researchers found that MitoQ induced rapid swelling of mitochondria in those proximal tubule cells. Now, what do the proximal tubules do? They do several things. So the kidneys, uh, each kidney is about a million filters. For those of you who may not remember, the filter membrane in that uh, filter is the endothelium, the intima, the lining of the artery wall. So the arteries get smaller and smaller and smaller until there's nothing left. The media, the muscle layer uh, fades away and there's nothing but that intima layer. So then uh, that's the beginning of urine, whatever filters through that starts with the urine. But then in the proximal tubules, there are things like glucose that gets filtered through. And those proximal tubules will pull that um, glucose back into the bloodstream. Now, how do they do that? Again, as I said, there's a, it's a high pressure area. There's a lot of work being done there. So the kidneys are very, uh, they're very important. You can't function very well without your kidneys. <clears throat> in this study performed in mice, uh, it, as I said, it, dam- it appeared to create damage and swelling of those proximal tubules. Um, this highlights the point that drugs may have an unexpected side effect. And remember, w- we use the term drug. Most people would not use the term drug for a supplement because they, quote, assume that a supplement is safe, that it's been reviewed and that they're, um, it's safe for over-the-counter sales. Mm. Be careful when you make that assumption. So that's the discussion today about the quote, new, uh, exciting, um, supplement antioxidant. If you'll give us the, uh, the intro to the Q and a, we'll get into Q and a next. So, the pork rind fast. Desitivity, good morning. <clears throat> JMK2921. Tell us where you're from, Desitivity, if you don't mind. JMK2921, since my non STEMI and LAD stint, um, LAD is um, non STEMI, is, uh, it's a heart attack. It's a uh, talking about whether or not it went through the entire thickness of the myocardium. And LAD is um, uh, left anterior descending. M- most people, when they hear that term, they look it up and they say, oh, that's the Widowmaker. Well, 
it's the widow maker because uh, heart attacks are the most common cause of making a widow. And that's the most common place to get plaque of the heart uh, arteries. So since that non STEMI and LAD stent in 2019, I've undergone three, quote, stress tests, end quote, all normal. My cardiologist informed me that Medicare will not cover a CCTA, CCTA, CCTA. Uh, you know what? Uh, rather than me look that up while I'm here, why don't you remind us all what CCTA is? Rick Folia, where do you get the fract fractionation tests with the chart? Quest seems only to produce the numbers chart. Uh, I don't know exactly what you're talking about, Rick. I will say this. Up until about a year ago, they used to actually give us the bell curves. So what fractionation is? For those of you who don't know, um, you know, it, it gets back to that old, old story and analogy about six blind men and the elephant. You know, one's feeling the side and he says he's like a wall. Another one feels the trunk and says he's like a snake. Another one feels the leg, says, no, he's like, he's like a palm tree. They're all right, but they're just looking at different, different aspects. Well, the same thing happens with so many things in life. You know, these people, he, here's my perspective on the LDL battle. The people that say LDL is bad and the people that say LDL is good are both right because they didn't dig deep enough. They're looking at the at a piece of the elephant. So the guys that are saying LDL is bad are looking at small, dense LDL. The guys that are saying that um, it's good are looking at the large, fluffy LDL. Well, you can't really get those until you fractionate. That's part of what fractionation is all about. Now, speaking of Quest and what they provide, about a year ago, up until about a year ago, they actually showed us the components of the bell curve for each of these things, you know, and that's what we want to know. We want to know, is the LDL bell curve shifted towards the small end, which is usually caused by prediabetes and diabetes, because those of us who have diabetic or insulin resistant metabolism going on replace the, the, um, the cholesterol in the large fluffy LDLs, the healthy ones with fatty acids. When a fatty acid laden LDL passes through the liver, the liver does, uh, metabolizes it. So it chews up all of our large fluffy LDL. Now, uh, if that hit you too fast, too far with a whole bunch of way too technical stuff, I did a whole, excuse me just a minute. Something's tickling my nose here. I did a whole video on this for about an hour and a half, a year or two ago. And if you want to look at it, um, you can go to YouTube, look at my channel and look at HDL over, I mean, triglyceride over HDL ratio. Uh, there are several different videos on it. One of them covers this specific item. And I go through and I actually show um, images, markups of the Quest Labs that Rick Folia is talking about. But Rick, I, there are pieces of this that I don't know what you're saying. Are you saying they don't, they don't have the, the bell curves anymore? Well, I know that, you know, and that was what I used to use and they don't listen to me. I'm just one doc in a very large country full of docs. But I can get what I need out of it by looking at the indicators. They do give us some basic numbers that we can look at. And if you've done this enough, you can look at the numbers and figure out where you are in terms of health. And that's the goal when you do this. Um, I hope that helps. I hope that's uh, that's responding to what you're talking about, Rick. Um, Bobby Ocampo, Mabu Hai. Mabu Hai to you, Bobby. Uh, long, beautiful life. That's what we're all here about, trying to assure that we have a long, beautiful life. Harvey Ops, hit the like, folks. Thank you so much, Harvey, for the reminder. You know, <clears throat> if you want to help us get this content out, and the content is out, it is saving lives. It's all over the world. And um, you can do it by you know, one of the things we talked about, a, a Patreon uh, contribution. You can join the membership program here on YouTube. 
uh, or you can even just hit the like button. And when you do that, that makes a difference. That tells the, um, the AI, the artificial intelligence that drives this information in front of other people and suggests it to them. It's telling them, hey, look, other humans find this information valuable. An even more effective way to do that is to put it in your other social media accounts like Facebook. If you put this link uh, to this video or one of our videos in another another social media like Facebook or Twitter and Facebook is, I mean, and YouTube is able to pull eyeballs away from another social media. They get really excited about that. So thank you so much, Harvey. I appreciate it. Bart Robinson, greetings. Greetings to you as well, Bart. Audrey Hurley, would you speak about NMN, NR, and niacin? Are they same thing, different, or... I would say or, or maybe I should answer that as yes. So in, 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 in is, uh, it's not David Sinclair's most recent uh, version into the magic pill that's going to save us all from the ravages of old age, but it's one of them. You know, he was, gosh, 30 years ago, we were talking about resveratrol. You may not remember that. Resveratrol is the stuff that you find in um, red wine. And yes, it helps. NMN, uh, NMN, yes, it helps. NR, it helps. Um, these are all niacin. If you look at all these metabolically and biochemically, the end component on all of those is very, very similar. And it's similar to uh, part of the, the nucleotide components of DNA. But this part is found in the mitochondria. In fact, it's part of the coinage that the mitochondria uses for transferring in energy from one molecule to the next, to the next, to the next, as it removes, um, as it oxidizes carbon-carbon uh, bonds. Now, <clears throat> are they all the same? They have similar components. They appear to be similar enough to where they're all focusing on the same area. If you look up David... Uh, Sinclair, and I've got some, for example, if you go to my series on his book, Lifespan, we talk about sirtuins, S-I-R-T-U-I-N-S. -S. And all of these are very much related to the sirtuins, which again are the building blocks or the coinage for energy within the mitochondria. Now, are they, from a supplement's perspective, are they all the same? No, not exactly. They're not the same. Um, are they in the same category? Yes, they're in the same category. Do they, any of them actually save you? No, well, no, no, not really. Uh, L niacin can help if you've got LP little a. I have taken many versions of the, all three of these versions, by the way. I've taken NMN, I've taken NR, nucleus, nucleotide riboside, I think is the, the full name. And I've clearly taken niacin for years. Audrey, I hope that helped. Sam Merzikhanian, Merzikhanian. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Where are you from, Sam? Dr. Brewer, are you still taking an ACE inhibitor? How about metoprolol? Which one is better? Thank you. God bless. I, I, I avoid beta blockers like the plague. Carvedilol is the least worst offender in the beta blocker group. And when I say beta blocker, I'm talking about metoprolol. Um, metoprolol is a beta blocker. Beta, um, beta agonists or beta actors increase our blood pressure, increase our heart rate a little bit. Um, so beta blockers will decrease our blood pressure. Uh, I don't recommend those. The, why? Because those increase your risk for, uh, significantly for insulin resistance, the major killer. 
Now, if you've had a stent, if you've had a heart attack over the past six months, you probably, or, or if you have uh, significant forms of heart failure, all, with all three of those, you're probably going to need some version of a beta blocker at some point. And if you're taking a beta blocker, I'd recommend taking one of the ones that is less likely to push us down that diabetes highway like carvedilol. But clearly, if you can avoid them, do so. ACE inhibitors are my, um, my first drug of choice for blood pressure management. They help with cardiovascular inflammation as well as decreasing um, uh, the blood pressure. And when you put those together with a low dose of a statin, they have a multiplicative, not additive effect on cardiovascular inflammation. Am I still taking mine? I took mine for years and I, would, <laughs> I had a significant cough. So I have backed off, of, uh, it was about two months ago, and uh, after, what, a decade of coughing with ACE inhibitors, I still have coughing problems because I have my biggest problem leading to coughing is not an ACE inhibitor. It's uh, an allergy problem that I inherited from my mom. So anyhow, I'm taking an ARB right now, uh, Losartan and amlodipine. Bobby Ocampo, best is just to call everything diabetes. Endocrinologists want you want you to maintain A1 hemoglobin A1C to seven. Mm. So two different points and two different reactions. Yes, uh, just assume you have di uh, diabetes and prediabetes. Number one, assume prediabetes is the same as diabetes. Number two, assume you have it until absolutely proven otherwise. And if even if you get one of these OGTTs, unfortunately, most OGTTs come with a lab interpretation, and unfortunately, the labs interpret it badly. So here's the way the labs interpret it. And I've seen this, if I've seen it once, I've seen it, gosh, hundreds of times, where patients did actually get an OGTT. They read the lab interpretation and said, oh, well, good, I'm fine. The lab is set up for nothing except two standard deviations. Well, two standard, standard deviations means one out of uh, five out of 100 or one out of 20. And you're getting plaque at more like 10 out of 20. Because if you start thinking about it, you start looking at the statistics. This is very true. I'm not making it up. What portion of people have prediabetes at starting at what age? Well, the CDC, it depends on, if you still look at the CDC's outdated site, they would say one third starting at age 60. Much more uh, conclusive data, much more uh, reliable data has come out of the JAMA network. It's come out of uh, UCLA and both of them say the same thing. Starting at age 30, it's one out of two. So if, there, if the lab is assuming that everybody's normal except for 5%, then they're going to be labeling a lot of people with diabetes and prediabetes as normal. And that is exactly what happens. So when you get a number one, it's not enough to just test, don't guess. You hear that all the time, especially in the Baildenine community. The problem is make sure you know how to interpret it, the results if you do get a test. So, Bobby, is there a research on seed oil that causes inflammation? I've gone down that path, and I think there's a little something to seed oil issues. There's no question that there is a little something to it, but I'm not nearly as big of an enemy of those other oils. I don't use them, um, and I try to... I, I, one of my biggest sources for those is that I eat it out at restaurants a lot. And when I eat at a restaurant, I usually eat salads. And I just don't like regular uh, olive oil and vinegar or salad dressing. I usually get some combination of ranch and Thousand Island. And I know that those restaurants do use uh, some of the less good oils. Uh, so that's my major source. 
Uh, we're eating out a lot less these days, and I'm back on, you know, my oils, which are good olive oil and uh, avocado oil. oil. Barbara, I was in, speaking of the, of the word oil, or oil, or oil, olive oil, I remember uh, back when I was in, it was like fourth grade, and the, my fourth grade teacher made fun of me and made a big deal of the way I pronounced the word oil. And I, maybe I'm still not pronouncing it right. You be the judge. Bart Robinson, I do enjoy pork rinds. Hey, Doc, have you ever had Scrapple? It's a big favorite here in South Jersey. I have. And the time I had it, I was an anti-fat guy, so I didn't eat very much of it. I think I should. It's a good idea. I think I should wonder if they've got Scrapple on I'm going to be going to the grocery store over the next 24 hours. I'll see if we've got some here at our local Kroger. Thank you for the suggestion. Desitivity. Natto. Thank you so much. Yeah, Natto is that fermented uh, bean paste. Uh, you can get it in a powder, and it tastes bad, too. Thank you so much, Desitivity. Natto. Yep, yep, yep. We call uh, Barbie, uh, we call pork rinds chicharrones. Or chicharrones. Yeah, chicharrones. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nato, Nato. Thank you, Ray. Drax of the North. I noticed my cardiologist never tests my C-reactive protein. Which test would you consider appropriate as part of a routine cardiologist checkup? Well, at least once a year, you do need to get an OGTT with insulin response. Because if that's the number one driver of a cardiology problem, why aren't you looking for it? And guess how many cardiologists I've met that do that? Hmm, I have actually met a couple of them, but I'm in that community. Uh, the vast majority do not. They don't know how to interpret. They've never even heard of a Kraft insulin survey. So that's, that's a must do. Uh, cardiovascular inflammation. C-reactive protein is the most common for having what we call biological false positives. So I wouldn't do just C-reactive protein alone. I would do C-reactive pro protein, MPO, myeloperoxidase, which is an actor. It's an enzyme that uh, actually attacks plaque and inflame, causes that inflammation. I do uh, LPPLA2 or PLAC2. That's another enzyme made also by another version, another uh, family of cells in the immune system where we're taking a uh, friendly fire. Our own immune system is attacking the plaque that's in our artery walls, just like it is with MPO. And we can test for that. So that's PLAC2 and MPO. MPO is made by the uh, polymorphs, uh, PMNs, nucleo uh, nucleosides, and uh, PLAC2 is made by the macrocytes. There's one other that I would look at, microalbumin creatinine ratio. Remember we talked about the kidneys today and I talked about the filtration process. Microalbumin creatinine ratio, no, albumin is the number one protein that's found in the serum. It's not gonna be a problem to lose it in terms of losing albumin. But what is the problem is this, if your kidney is leaking albumin into the uh, urine, if it's leaking through that intima, then we know that the intima has some damage or some functional problems. If microalbumin creatinine, or if uh, micro, you've got microalbumin in your urine, you're very likely to have uh, albumin leaking through, if albumin's leaking through the intima in the, uh, in the kidney, you're very likely to have L, um, small, dense, oxidized LDL leaking through that intima into the artery wall in the rest of the arterial tree. I went fast. I jumped around. Let me see if I can say that more succinctly. Microalbumin creatinine ratio. It shows whether you're not you're spilling microscopic amounts of protein into the urine. If you are, it's because of uh, problems with the intima, the filter layer in the kidney. And therefore, you're probably also leaking cholesterol versions back into the artery wall to form plaque. So back up to, you know, you asked me a simple question, Drax of the North, what should be part of a routine, what labs should be part of a routine cardiology 
checkup. And I'm just telling you. So we talked about root cause, looking at root cause with OGTT and insulin response. We talked about uh, cardiovascular inflammation panels we, and a panel, not just doing that one C-reactive protein test because so many things cause a false positive C-reactive protein. The um, other thing that I haven't gotten into is, you know, most docs will look at a basic um, lipid profile, your cholesterol tests, which despite the fact that Thomas Dayspring, one of the more well-known uh, lipidologists in the world would say, that tells you nothing. He's not right. It does. tell. I'm a big fan of his, but I don't agree with everything he says. Uh, the routine uh, lipid test cholesterol panel does tell us a whole lot. And the place that it tells us is about our carb metabolism, triglyceride over HDL. Uh, and that's very important. But still, we talked a few minutes ago about fractionation. Most cardiologists don't get fractionation on their routine tests. So as you can see, uh, <laughs> I'm loaded for that question. There's just a lot of things that need to be covered on labs for a cardiology visit. Bart, Rob, and, and those are the sort of things that we do, by the way, um, when you come see us. Um, Gilbert, if you'll show Michelle's number up there, uh, that's what we do for a living, Drax. We go through the lab, a lot of the labs that I just discussed. We talk about lifestyle. We talk about what's going on with you, your specific risks, and we rule out other uh, specific risks like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, other inflammatory diseases, psoriatic arthritis, um, LP little a, the thing that caused Bob Harper's heart attack, um, and several other things. FH and the relative importance of FH, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, versus other causes of really high LDL, which are benign, like uh, lean mass hyperresponder. So those are actually um, part of the reason that I went into that level of details and was talking so fast is that's what we do all day, every day. So give us a call if you'd like for us to to do that for you, Drax. Bart Robinson, Wild Planet brand sardines are the best, in my opinion. Yep. Uh, and you know what I did, Bart? I, uh, you know, it's hard enough for me to eat sardines. I mean, it's like, talk, as we discussed, acquired taste. Now, the first time I got them, I had heard they were great, too. And then the first time I got them, it was like, Oh, these are even worse than regular sardines. And what I didn't realize was I had ordered them on Amazon and I got the ones that were packed in olive oil. So a lot of people might like that. I didn't. And the ones that I showed you a picture on were yeah, packed in olive oil. So I saved the ones that are packed, packed in olive oil to use my version, uh, to make in my version of uh, French onion and sardine soup, which I did. I don't think I covered that today, did I? We'll have to cover that later. French onion and sardine soup without the toast and cheese is optional. But other than that, I would agree with it. It's a good brand. Wild Planet. Sandra Dabrowski, not an option for vegetarians. How about potato chips? Well, if you'd like to die young, potato chips are a good option. They're full of carbs they're full of the things that uh, really push insulin, uh, increase obesity. Um, and yeah, if you want to go fast, that's a great way to do it. Uh, pardon the sarcasm. I think that uh, I'm hoping that you're talking about sarcasm as well. And yes, there's no question. <laughs> Pork rinds are not a, are not, uh, a, not a good option for... Uh, for vegetarians. Now, uh, let me say this. Um, you can do just fine in terms of a vegetarian diet uh, and low carb. I've proven that. I've demonstrated it. Uh, you just have to uh, be ready to get a lot of your calories from oils, preferably good oils like uh, avocado oil and olive oil and good olive oil. 
Don Stewart, I eat pork rinds all the time. I like them. So does my wife. Yeah, you saw a couple. They're getting, they're starting to come out with some that have a lot better flavor. That, that one, that, that brand that I showed you, the, it's a name like 20, I mean, it's a number like 2035 or something. That one is good. And the uh, pork, P O R K. I mean, no, no, P O R Q, not P O R K, P O R Q. Uh, the artisan, they're uh, really highbrow artisan um, pork rinds. And it's sort of like oxymoron, right? Hi, uh, highbrow artisan pork rinds. Bart Robinson, I recently had a CRP. It was high sensitivity CRP. Is that okay? Yes. That's one, the one you want. You want the HS CRP. It was in range and that's good. Glad to hear it. Bobby Ocampo, we have lots of fermented fish. And fermented krill. I wonder if they have vitamin K2. That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. They probably have a whole lot of really good uh, omega-3s, though. Don Stewart, we use pork rinds and meatloaf instead of bread. Ah, that's a really good idea. You know, so <clears throat> have you ever heard, I'm going to show a picture of one of my favorite new food discoveries in this same area. It's called pork panko. And it's very similar to what you're talking about, Don. I used to love fried chicken. I loved my grandmother's, then my mother's fried chicken. And, you know, once I went low carb, I thought I did give up a whole lot of stuff. But then as things developed and I learned a lot more and um, a lot more uh, substitutes came out, you know, there's some fairly good keto breads out there on Amazon and they're not really keto, but they're pretty close. Well, one of the things I learned under the category of learning something, I learned I could make fried chicken, zero carb fried chicken. And I make it with pork panko. If you haven't heard of pork panko before, and we'll keep you in suspense, we'll have a we'll have a uh, we'll have a prelim deck on pork panko soon. I actually sent pictures of it to uh, Jesus and uh, and Gilbert today. Bobby Ocampo, we have crispy pork intestine and pris crispy pork face, crispy pork legs. Sounds like a, a crispy pork. Thank you, Bobby. Don Stewart, Big Pharma does not want us to have a cure for anything. Well, if they, if we did, if we cured everything, they wouldn't have a reason for being. They want us to take a pill for the rest of our lives. Vape King, I read that calcium supplements can cause atherosclerosis, and I used to take them. Now I have coronary artery disease. Uh, I think that's a little bit... I, I think that's one of those things where I, I, I'm skeptical. And one of the reasons I'm skeptical is because that everybody sees calcium score. You know, you get calcium at, with plaque. First of all, you get inflammation. Then you get plaque, uh, inflamed plaque. And then as you sl slow down the inflammation, it starts to calcify like many things do in the body when, we're healing. Um, uh, I think that concept, I, I, as I look at the hard data, I'm skeptical. And I think that the concept that taking calcium actually results in you getting calcium in your arteries. I don't agree that that's a, a reality, at least from what I see. Now, I will also say, I don't recommend calcium because um, there's not a good, <clears throat> especially for middle-aged people, uh, there's not a good, um, a good point to be made for that, with one exception, and that is people with osteoporosis. Different issue, different time. Jonathan Hull, good morning, Dr. B. I put one quart cup of mixed berries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, very healthy berries, very low sugar, but good healthy berries in my supplement every day. Is this a good source of antioxidants? Um, you know, one thing I, I think it is, the only thing I would say is, you know what, uh, why don't you just check your glucometer 
30 minutes after you take that uh, supplement and make sure it's not cranking your glucose. It's not likely to with, um, with the things that you're taking. Bart Robinson, just got to be careful with too much fruit. Yeah, that's my, my point as well. And that's why I'm saying, look, just do a, take a, a, take your blood sugar. Bobby Ocampo consulted a new cardiologist and insisted on lowering my LDL, even if my HDL is already 60. Triglyceride is now less than 100 using niacin. Are there side effects on PCSK9? There are some side effects. Um, you know, the doctors have gotten really enthusiastic about PCSK9s because they really do lower LDL a lot. And if you're a doctor that thinks LDL drives all this problem, uh, then the PCSK9s become a big issue. They're not incredibly, uh, you know, most of, I, I don't know of a single over the, I mean, uh, oral PCSK9 yet, they're injected. Uh, that's an issue in and of itself, but it's not a big one. You can get, you know, the things that you tend to get with injections, injection site inflammation and stuff like that. But other than that, they have tended to be fairly safe. I'm not, not so worried about um, the side effect profile for them. Drax of the North, are you familiar with C60, carbon 60 antioxidant, another snake oil? Not familiar with it, Drax? Good question. Sorry, I don't. Sorry, I'm not. Bobby Ocampo, any study on several days fasting and kidney health? Um, uh, no, and I, I, I guess if you're asking, does it cause a problem with kidney health? Uh, I, you, you, there are plenty of studies that show the impact of several days of fasting, and they all... all all have shown, and it, almost all have shown very good results. I think the jury is in on prolonged fasting and it's healthy for you. Uh, one of the things that it helps you do is control your weight, your body fat, and therefore your insulin resistance, which is the number one cause of significant kidney disease. So uh, maybe I'm not understanding your point, but um, for the most part, those of us that can fast several days are doing good for our kidneys. Desitivity is in Georgia. Thank you, Desitivity. Hope to have your Medicare Advantage service soon. We're working on it. Please, uh, please cheer for us and pray for us that we can get past the bureaucrats. JMK2921, my cardiologist has chewed me out because I'm taking only five milligrams of Crestor daily for my LDL of 128. Well, welcome to the club. Can you cite some good sources that prove low dose statins are as effective as high intensity? Yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, one of the simplest, easiest way to do that is just look. Um, Paul, uh, Gavin Blake and Paul. Oh, gosh, somebody remind me. Well, Paul Ridker. Uh, look up some of the stuff by Paul Ridker and Gavin Blake, where they're talking about uh, the differences in statins. And Paul Ridker is, you know, way deep into statins and inflammation. So he's got he's got a ton of work out there, and a lot of it deals with this specific issue. Melissa got my doctor to change me to Crestor instead of Lipitor. However, he ordered 20 after an MI. Do you think five a day is sufficient? And the answer is usually yes. Um, and I will also say this. Pardon me. I keep having to. Uh, I hope I don't have any. Um, I, I, I can. <clears throat> I, I have a lot of docs that I teach. I hire and, and manage the performance of docs for a living. But I cannot go out there and change every person's cardiologist or doctor and, you know, open their head up and do surgery on their perceptions about statins and change them. If, <laughs> if, you'd, if you'd like to see me, you can. Uh, we do a telemedicine practice. I have patients in 50 states of the union. And it's funny. Um, the doc, the, this happens all the time. Uh, patients come in, see me with that, have a doc that do like you're doing, Melissa. And uh, uh, 
Gilbert, if you'll show if you'll show the telephone number real quick. Um, <clears throat> after you, the patient starts seeing me and I put them on that dosage, uh, you know, it, it tends to become a non-issue and they move on. But to ask them to write that dosage, ah, that's hard. You're dead meat, 69. Skip through MITO-Q, evidencing damage at, at the lowest level of filtration in the kidney means no thank you to this new antioxidant. Uh, that's where I'm at, dead meat. Drags to the north. Is there a study I can present to my cardiologist to help convince him my dosage of resubostatin currently at uh, I mean, yeah, I get a lot of questions on that. And again, all I can say is, you know, just start. <clears throat> I, I will, by the way, see if we'll put that on our list. We've got a long, long list right now of um, let me just make a note, low dose statin. Uh, video. Let's see if we can just make a video on that. I've, I've got several out there. Uh, hopefully we can just go ahead and get that in our queue and start uh, creating one of those again. CCTA is, oh, coronary CT angiogram. So why would he not want to do a CCTA? Uh, if you've had a stent, sometimes that'll change the, the results of the stent. And, I'll, you know, all those CCTAs are... Um, are good for uh, a lot of things. You know what I would suggest. What I would suggest and ask JMK is why. Why don't you just do a um, a CIMT? Call that number up there, and Michelle can get you help you get set up and find a place that can do a good CIMT with you. Uh, we can interpret it if you can't find somebody else that can. Those are better anyway. Uh, desitivity. Speaking of supplements, Doc, do you have an opinion on citrulline? I do. I've learned the hard way that I shouldn't eat too much watermelon. Huh. Because of problems with citrulline? Um, citrulline is a big, it's a big deal in the bodybuilding community. They think it helps them get all swoped up, you know, big muscles, swell them up due to dil dil dilatation, dilatation, of their arteries in those muscles. Is it that big of a deal? I haven't seen it to be. Bobby Ocampo, because we don't have CIMT, I tried coronary duplex scan ultrasound. Results show I don't have soft plaque, class one and class two, only class three. Well, that's interesting. If it's showing whether or not you've got soft plaque, that's all we need to know, Bobby. Thank you so much. Let me look. Oh, you know, I thought we were going to be able to cover all of the discussion uh, questions today, but here's one of the problems is as we've gotten up and rolling, I mean, it's just, we've gotten a lot more coming in. I'm going to handle as many as I can, but I, I'm going to have to, it's only going to be a few more. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Bobby. Bobby's saying share this information. I appreciate that. Jonathan Baird, CFA. Hello, Dr. Brewer. I appreciate your work. I've read it. I've read that it is very important to take TMG, trimethylglycine, if you're taking niacin to raise HDL and lower LDL and triglyceride. What are your thoughts? I don't know how important it is, but I take it. Uh, the other is another name for it. B E T A I N E, beta ene, trimethylglycine. And here's the the problem. So th the point is this: um, taking niacin is supposed to deplete your methyl groups. Methyl groups are important for antioxidant uh, purposes. You know, by far the biggest supplement category out there is antioxidants, certain vitamins A, E, and C. And yes, they're antioxidants, but, you know, if the body does something naturally, it's going to be far more efficient than any kind of supplement or anything else. And the body accomplishes its antioxidant functions using methyl groups. We've talked about that many, many times. Uh, for example, if you have a an elevated homocysteine that's clearly um, 
evidence that you're a poor methylator. Is poor methylation a real thing? Or is it just something that some crazy internet people made up? No, it's a real thing. I used to work in a human genetics lab. I am one of those over half of us that ha that's a poor methylator. The reality is once you actually start looking at, um, at metabolism and more subtle versions of diabetes, it matters. It clearly matters. You see uh, people, you know, damage to the eye, the retina of the eye that is increased in people that are poor methylators. So you do want to have healthy methylation uh, going on. There's a couple of ways of improving methyl groups. One is TMG, as you've heard, Jonathan. The other is um, another supplement that's got a lot of methyl groups. You see, it's the vitamin B complex that our body uses as the, again, currency or coinage to hold on to the methyl, methyl groups and form a pool that it can use. Um, if you're not a good methylator, that's the recommendation. Get one Thorn Methyl Guard Plus. Doctor's Best has a good one. Jero has a good one. Again, what they are, all these just generically are uh, vitamin B complex supplements, but the vitamin B uh, complex is methylated. Great question. Thank you for bringing it up. Jonathan, Noam Halamutis, does niacin help reduce your LDL level? Great question. Thank you so much for asking it. Niacin is really good. It's the only thing that we know of, prescription or otherwise that decreases LDL, decreases triglyceride, decrease, uh, increases HDL. It also decreases LP little a. So uh, it's a very, very um, important supplement. It's one of the top two supplements that I use, the other one being vitamin D. Gnome halamutis. What is the best way to reduce fat from your liver? That's also another really good question. Well, it depends on the cause of fat in your liver. And the vast majority, like what, 95, 98% of fatty livers are caused by prediabetes and diabetes. Manage the diabetes, prediabetes, and you manage the liver. And all of this is a glucose metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism problem. First of all, by far, the most important thing is to get to a pro an appropriate amount of body fat. For most of that, uh, that translates to a BMI in the low 20s. And when I say low 20s, I'm not talking about 24. I'm talking about 20, 21, 22, maybe 23. Get there. And look again, because the vast majority of us that get there do deal with this problem. Now, there are people like me and others, especially as we age into this, that still have insulin resistance as even though we have low body fat. And if you've got insulin resistance, remember, that's the number one cause of fatty liver. So how, do you, how else do you deal with that if you're thin? but you're still uh, pre-diabetic, diabetic, don't eat carbs. Carbs are poison to you. Stay thin, don't eat carbs, and look at the impact of that on fatty liver. Look at the impact of that on the rest of your, uh, your health indicators. If I could get people to just do those two things, I'd have to find a new job. <laughs> there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a need for me. So I'm going to have to go. Thank you so much for your interest and attention today.